good day to all of our viewers, the students and teachers involved in the We the People the Sits in the Constitution program, as well as citizens who are just generally interested in the topics and issues uh, addressed by our Constitution or that we deal with it on a daily basis as part of the American political culture. Um, the We the People program, in my opinion, is probably one of the most important and effective programs, uh, uh, civic ed programs to ever exist. Uh, and uh, uh, if you're not aware of it, uh, for those few out there who just might be generally interested, I suggest that you uh, look into it. Um, we welcome you to our second episode of the 2023 uh, uh, season, uh, an edition of the Constitution and American Life. I did want to point out, if you happen to notice uh, uh, the grand poobah of our uh, of our band here, Professor Tim Moore, get up and move around. It's not that he's in a dancing mood, but he he did have to deal with uh, elderly surgery. Uh, you know what happens to all of us when we start to break down. Uh, after age sixty, okay. uh, let me quali let me qualify that a little bit. It was it was, it was, <laughs> it was knee replacement, folks. Oh, okay. Isn't that one of the classic surgeries for elderly people? Well, but you left it open ended there. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My, I was trying to wing it. I was trying to wing it. You know. You know how. Man, I am with the English language. So in our last episode, I, I forgot to mention that uh, we have a rising star of the screen amongst the fops, a man of grace, thoughtfulness, and a face made for the big and small screen. And that is Professor Kavanaugh from the great state of North Dakota. Recently, uh, Cece, uh, 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 I heard you were asked to testify to the North Dakota legislature about the importance of funding for civic education programs. And according to one viewer that I talked to, your mere presence on the screen screen caused their heart to skip a beat. So uh, mm -hmm. Professor Kavanaugh, uh, tell us a little bit about your experience as a citizen lobbyist for civic education. I, I, I heard that you're on your cell phone, uh, making connections with a lot of people. Uh, uh, doing some lobbying was I was sitting there uh, as uh, other folks were going through their uh, budget line item by line item. Um, but I don't know how effective I was because by the time I left, they said, you guys owe us money. <laughs> so, uh, but no, I had the chance to, to lobby on behalf of the uh, We the People program here in the state of North Dakota with a, uh, a committee, Senate committee that uh, does appropriations and talking about the importance of uh, growing the program. So. We'll find out at some point whether or not uh, our efforts were successful. I was not just me. There were other We the People teachers there as well that uh, speaking from the heart. I just spoke about the importance of civic education. Um, so we'll, well see. my source says that you look like a man who belonged in the halls of a legislative branch. Uh, I did have I did have a suit on. So, um, yes. <laughs> and I, I wore it to school that day and man, my students were like, oh, well, you, you, you got to go to see the judge about something? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's about right. So I can uh, sincerely say that I am excited about tonight's discussion. We're going to be focusing on a quote by Mercy Otis Warren, warning that the Philadelphia Constitution created the, a foundation or the foundation uh, for an aristocratic tyranny. Since that is exactly what I believe we have in this country, I can't wait to hear uh, on uh, our experts on Ms. Warren's uh, insights. So let's begin our discussion, uh, and I'll open it to all three of the FOPs, and that is, again, on first glance, when you first saw this question, what jumped out at you uh, as either a key idea, principle that uh, you, know, you think the kids need to be aware of? Uh, uh, Professor Kavanaugh? Well, uh, just make sure, students, when you're jumping into this, that you're, you know, paying attention to the language that she used that day, you know, and, and when she's writing this uh, in, in response to the Constitution, because, um, you know, it's uh, the terminology, whether it be aristocracy or democracy or other terms, uh, there are very narrow definitions at that time frame. So, don't get set in a modern sense of the definition. Think about defining the word as the words 
or the vocabulary as they existed in that time period, not in uh, 2023. Professor Moore. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think it's uh, what jumped out to me uh, when I first saw the question was uh, uh, so much of the stuff that appears in unit two is by men. Um, and uh, so that it's notable that I think uh, that Mercy Otis Warren is getting a uh, uh, getting some props here. Uh, in fact, I mean, it's it's weird about this this uh, this piece that she wrote. I think for the longest time, it wasn't even believed that she wrote it. That it had uh, it was a man that wrote it, and and uh, I think some um, uh, great grandkid or I, I don't know the exact details, but it was down the road of history that was figured out it was Mercy Otis Warren. Um, she was, and it's interesting because so much of her writing is not um, is not political. It's it's uh, poetry and plays and things like that. So it, it's uh, she's an interesting person uh, to consider um, to be included in all this legacy of Unit Two questions that are um, from from men and pseudonyms of men. Professor Williams. Yeah, those I think those those two are great. I guess I'll kind of dovetail on Chris a little bit and I would I would phrase it as the students you need to you need to define what she may have meant by aristocratic uh, aristocratic tyranny if you can but then what do you mean by it and what did it mean in its original form um, I'm, as I'm sure we're going to talk about aristocracy literally means rule of the best and so if we have a tyranny of rule of the best Maybe that's not a bad thing, but I, I know that's not the way she was using it. It's probably not the way we would use it today. But when you're thinking about a bad form of rule, that's a rule of the few, it can take different, it can take different sort of um, compositions, I guess. And I, I would want you to make sure that you define clearly either what you as a unit, what it is you're going to define it as, or what the disagreements are as a unit, what you think uh, tyranny and aristocracy means for you in 2023 and be ready for the judges to I think kind of have a dialogue with you about those even those definitions well and uh, I guess what jumped out at me was uh, in our last episode we were looking at Socrates and uh, his uh, issues with uh, uh, democratic license the democratic man and with democracy in general uh, and there seems to be a pretty good thematic bridge uh, between uh, our last episode and then this episode uh, on uh, uh, aristocratic uh, tyranny uh, there. So uh, I think, in fact, uh, Professor Kavanaugh might have said in our last episode to Unit 1 students that you may want to talk to Unit 2 students. And uh, I'd say the same thing, Unit 2 students, you may want to talk to Unit 1 students uh, uh, about uh, uh, their question that they uh, dealt with. So let's begin our, our more focused discussion here with Professor Moore. And I'm wondering, Tim, would it be accurate to describe the Constitution of 1787 as a conservative reaction to the revolutionary constitutions of the previous decade? And, and I say that because, you know, one, I, one, they're, they're new constitutions. So, and there, as I think, you know, was said last week, they're, they're in many ways much more democratic than the national constitution. So that's why I frame them as revolutionary constitutions. Is the national constitution much more conservative in your opinion? Um, yes. I mean, this, this, uh, this is a, um, the question you've asked, uh, David, is, is kind of uh, a semester long course that Merrill Jensen used to have way back in the day. And, uh, and it, it basically, it was a lesson, it was a course on historiography of the revolution. And uh, so the progressive historians, and Jensen was one of the last great progressive historians, looked at the Constitution much differently than, um, than every, everybody that preceded them. Um, and so it's the progressive historians that have said, that, look, um, the Constitution, uh, undoes the revolution, um, that the Articles was the natural trajectory of the American Revolution, 
uh, a system that uh, put state sovereignty at the at the forefront was inevitable and it should have been um, and and the Constitution comes along and undoes all of that and anti federalist um, anti federalist that is a constant refrain through much of their writing this undoes the principles of the revolution um so it, it's it's the anti federalist argument and uh when you're looking at uh <laughs> you know it, it it's interesting that um there were six formal attempts to to amend the articles and all of them fail at various levels. Uh, some go down in spectacular flames. Uh, some of them actually nearly make it through, um, like the impost of 83 nearly made it through all the 13. Um, so in, in a way, if you look at those attempts to amend the articles, that's kind of a cautious approach to amending a document that had some weaknesses. And so then, then you get a constitutional convention that creates a constitution that's, you know, in the anti-federalist mind, totally opposite of the articles. Uh, yes, it's a counter-revolution. So I think that's the anti-federalist argument. It's it's a refrain through much of their writing, um, and and also I think it's counter-revolutionary to the state constitutions. Uh, because there's uh, Woody Holton's great book on the excesses of democracy in, in the 80s, uh, Unruly Americans, I think, is the title. So it's it's a counter to uh, the revolution, but it's also can be seen as a counter to the state experiments with democracy. So I, I would say that it is it is counter um, counter revolutionary. Mr. Mike, thoughts? Oh, I think I think it definitely is it is uh, it's. It's um, I think the Constitution is in response to the excesses of the revolutionary period. I mean, it's I, just... yeah. Any thoughts about that as far? And again, I'm glad you mentioned Tim Merrill Jensen, because that's kind of where you know, I, I, I grabbed this from, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, that uh, uh, I honestly had forgotten that he was one of the big progressive historians yeah. uh, uh, there. Um, but is it accurate to use the term conservative, Mike? That it's a conservative reaction? I, I do. I mean, the students should make sure we're talking small c conservative here. Um, right. Yeah. I mean, look, the, 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 the founders, as we know, were, were, were first and foremost pragmatists, it seems to me. And and the revolution, the Declaration of Independence, the articles that come out of it, um, their experience of being un under that form of rule, it, it wasn't looking good in terms of actual governing. So I think that it was conservative, but it was also very pragmatic. I think they would argue it's very pragmatic. What they had was not working and that it was gonna, the system was gonna crumble unless they did something dramatic to, to fix it. So, it's I, one more. I can't yeah. resist because you you uh, you interjected the word conservative. I was rereading a, a book within the last half year, and it's all about the politics of the Continental Congress. And there's this chapter in it, predictably, on the Continental Congress creating the rat, uh, creating the Articles of Confederation. Conservative in the Continental Congress when they were uh, creating the articles meant because um, there were radicals in the Continental Congress and there were conservatives. The conservatives uh, were seen as by the radicals. You want this Articles of Confederation to consolidate the country. We don't need a constitution right now. We need to pursue the revolution. So the argument, it's so interesting to me <laughs> that if you're labeled a conservative during the art, uh, during the Continental Congress, you're pro articles. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I mean, that's just so, it, to me, it's fascinating how the term is used in different times and the contexts are different. So, uh, so the word conservative is, 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 uh, is interesting um because it's you know you use it in the context was the was the constitution a conservative reaction 
Well, at the Continental Congress, there were some folks that saw the articles as a conservative reaction and a side issue to the revolution. Which I think brings brings home the point to students of of always having context for vocabulary uh, <laughs> there, because uh, language means different things at different times. So, Chris, it's kind of a two part and you get the vocabulary uh, uh, duty uh, tonight. And, and that is when Miss Warren identifies the potential of aristocratic tyranny, what, to the best of your knowledge, does she mean by aristocratic? Well, I think uh, we'll substitute a different word in there. I think, uh, which listening to Tim's description, uh, it makes me think of uh, any attempt at consolidation would 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 get into the possibility of some type of er, arist, uh, aristocracy and control. So, you know, um, so you're moving away from this idea of states doing their things to creating some type of national government. And now, again, there's a consolidation of power. And whenever you have this consolidation of power, there's a danger then of that power being in the hands of a few. And I think that's, uh, I mean, uh, we, I think we mentioned last episode, I maybe mentioned uh, the, uh, the downside, uh, if you think of Aristotle's chart in Unit 1, the downside to this type of government is, uh, is you know, arist when you have a, uh, aristocracy in, in control, it becomes self-serving. And so well, I think- Can I check you? I, I, I'm trying to remember that chart. Wasn't aristocracy on the side of good form and the bad form was oligarchy? Correct. Yes. So is, is, the, she, the, real, is she referencing danger, the, oligarchy? Well, the danger with either is the fact that they would become self-serving, right? Uh, what's that old notion about the golden rule? Whoever has the gold makes the rules. Um, I think so. I think when she's talking about this aristocracy, this tyranny of aristocracy, I think it's a fear of the consolidation of the government at the national level. And I think if... Um, students i, I uh, read this whole her whole passage she kind of has a little bit of a laundry list of the anti-federalist complaints about the constitution uh not only about the control of the military because that's i think the same if you do the reading it, it certainly scares the bejesus out of some folks but also in terms of uh the electoral college though she doesn't use that terminology how will we determine the magistrate she writes right. about how we determine the magistrate uh, because obviously at our level, at the state level, Massachusetts, where she's from, we get to, you know, she didn't, but people get to you know, like the governor. But now you're going to have a magistrate for the country. Who's going to do that? Well, it's going to be an elite few, right? Uh, she talks about the idea of biannual uh, elections as opposed to yearly elections. So there's she has a, a little bit of the uh, greatest hits, if you will, of the anti-federalists. Uh, in terms of their complaints about this consolidation of power. So I, so I think I see that tyranny I of guess I fell, Yeah, I guess I <laughs> fell into the trap of presentism then, because when I see aristocracy, I, I'm thinking about the rule of the few, all right, and that that the foundation of this, this constitution is anti-democratic, which is, uh, it seems to be, a complaint at the time, and it's a complaint throughout American history, and it's a complaint by some today that the Constitution is too anti-democratic, uh, uh, and 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 therefore it does lead to tyranny. But it seems, I guess, I'm wrong on my reading well, I, of that. I think maybe uh, maybe a, a little bit in terms of the, I mean, because I think if you, you think of the anti-federalist mindset is like. We all kind of agree we want these same things. Uh, I, I'm flashing back to to uh, John Patrick listening and talking at, at, at a summer institute how many years ago. But uh, both the Federalists and Anti-Federalists agreed uh, there about certain things. It's just uh, the Anti-Federalists, along with Mercy Otis Warren, is that we believe it's probably best done at the state level because it's a closer government as opposed to taking things away from us at the state level and giving it to this new entity that's going to be created by this document. And don't forget, she's still, she's still filtering things through the spirit. And Tim alluded to this in his, in his statement. She's still filtering things uh, through the spirit of 1776 and the constitutions that are created in 1776, you know, uh, 11 years prior. 
So I, I think that uh, that is her fear that this new government will create this consolidation uh, that will uh, therefore could could lead to this uh, tyranny, the minority or aristocracy. And I, th and I think Massachusetts, uh, Chris, you mentioned Massachusetts. This is huge. Uh, the folks in Man to this point of consolidation you're making, think about it, uh, Massachusetts the consolidation that occurred in 74 75 their legislature is prorogued um their the series of the intolerable acts boston pork bill uh their their legislature is prorogued the uh um you can be taken away and tried um in admiralty courts so if anybody knows what consolidation looks like it's going to be somebody in massachusetts and uh so i think she is so it's uh and that uh, the radicalism of massachusetts carries through into this into the continental congress they are seen as radicals and that equals radical whig theory decentralized anti um anti king anti consolidation so i think chris's point is well taken that this is a massachusetts thing that she's very familiar with coming out of the 76 as 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 chris has mentioned so, Mike, especially when we deal with these early units, you tend to get tagged with the political construct, political theory questions, and you've made it clear you're, that's not necessarily your field. But I was wondering, as Chris kind of mentioned, she specifically, and actually it's a laundry list of complaints that she has with the Constitution, but a couple that stood out to me was, you know, she, she lists the the lack of an annual election and the creation of a standing army are the very ingredients for aristocratic uh, tyranny. And I was thinking about it, you know, trying to put myself in the 18th century. Doesn't she have a point? And in fact, I would argue beyond <laughs> uh, the 18th century that she, she, there's, there's some validity to her point here. You agree or, or not? I think there's... I, <clears throat> I think there's some validity. I mean, to me, I I agree with so much of the arguments of the anti-federalists in principle. But when I put my political science hat on and I think about there are two, two simultaneous things happening in history at the time at this point, right? It's the creation of what we're going to call the modern state. And this is, I'm not talking about the state of Massachusetts. I'm talking about the nation an state, entity of, an entity of government that is no longer a city state. It's a large territory. And the first two institutions for any modern state are an army and an IRS. Like you need to t collect taxes and you need to have an army. And that's the lesson from Europe. So unless we're, unless we're going to have 13 modern states, Right. If, if we're going to go past that, we're going to have one big state. There has to be a standing army. I, I mean, to be a modern state, you have to have it. Now, there is a question when you have that modern army, who gets to have input on how it's directed? Right. And this is where she may be right. Like annual elections may not be enough. You don't want to have the privileged few having the only say on how the army is being used. Um, but th that, to me, they're kind of two separate questions. And while I think the anti-federalists have a lot of good arguments about maybe how our system of government is not participatory enough through the Constitution, we need more voices. There needs to be more citizen um, say over this national government. I'm less persuaded by this notion of that we can just have um, volunteer armies and that we're not going to get pummeled by the Spanish or the French or the British that we need to create a modern state. The question is, do we create it amongst what are then the 13 states or do we create sub ones and kind of all go at each other? So I kind of think she's right. I kind of think that she's missing the bigger, bigger changes happening in history at the time. Well, so again, back to, Mass back to Massachusetts, standing army, that's a huge deal for anybody in Massachusetts in the mid 70s, because there's a standing army and Massachusetts is saying, where, I mean, in English history, you have an army when there's a war. So they're asking, where's the war? 
Right. Uh, so standing army is a very sensitive in issue for anybody um, in Massachusetts. And right. also Massachusetts has annual elections too. So again, I keep harping on this. Think about Massachusetts here. Uh, think about what's going on as and, and as she is a citizen of Massachusetts, this is going to be front and center for her. Well, I'm sorry, David, but I, and to kind of agree with Tim, because you have to think about the lens at which people writing at the time, how they're viewing this, you know, and her lens is that of Massachusetts. But you also have people, and I think I think she alludes to Wilson in that writing, James yeah. Wilson. Uh, and there are others that they have a they have a a 30,000 foot view of things. You know, Wilson is, you know, he's he's talking about the inherent power of government prior to the Constitution about being able to create a national bank the inherent power of the uh, government to have a standing army. So, you know, there, there are people that are, I think, big picture, but her lens is uh, that very narrow lens. Well, we've had this, this discussion before, Tim, and, 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 and well, you know, get all of us here. And I, I'm just, I'm wondering, because it's 1788 when she writes this. So I'm wondering to what extent does, does, does she have any faith in the fact that that the, the standing army that, that occupied Massachusetts, the decision-making for that was not done by the American people. Sovereignty resided somewhere else. Mm -hmm. The sovereignty in this system is gonna be with the American people, which makes me question the sincerity of her argument. And it makes me question the sincerity of the anti-federalists. Um, well, the sovereignty of the people versus the sovereignty of the people in the states uh, or the or the states is not really is not really a uh, concluded arguably until the Civil War. So uh, so I don't I don't know that you can separate uh, a person like Mercy Otis Warren from uh, the sovereignty question in 1788. Um, now, I know that offends your fe your uh, federal reading uh, of the founding, but all I'm suggesting is <laughs> localism and state uh, level sovereignty is still an issue. We don't have, other, you know, and this is right during the time that the Mass uh, Massachusetts Leg uh, Convention is in, uh, it has ratified, which he's not happy with. But um, but I think, you know, back to the point about the, the standing army under the articles. Um, there was no standing army. There was only an officer corps, and they relied on, uh, I think, below the level of might have been captain, uh, was supplied by the state. So there's still that legacy of localism in the military with a national officer corps. And and frankly, as we know, the national office, officer corps was looked askance, uh, Society of Cincinnati and all of that uh, elitism, elitism that was associated with the society. Uh, Cincinnati. Um, so I, I don't know the, uh, you know, the, the uh, standing army is, is a big deal. Um, now I'm lost. I forget what your, what your statement or question was. I, I, I apologize. The sincerity for of her argument. Yeah, I think, I think, I think it is a sincere argument because they're looking at history and look, they, they, they there's a basic principle in anti-federalists um, well, and actually the Federalists believe this too, but the Anti-Federalists, I think more so or more rapidly, power corrupts. And when, and when you put people in charge that aren't under your microscope, that power, uh, that corruption is much easier. So localism and a dim view of humanity, I think drives a lot of this. Uh, now, some of it's hyperbole. I'll grant you that. Um, but I do think uh, it's not, it's, uh, I, I'm, I'm taking the anti-federalist more seriously than I think you might be at this point. Well, yeah, I, I absolutely, I think you are. This, this is not theoretical, ideological. This is just pure power. It's Massachusetts. She's an anti-federalist. Power is now going to be shifted. The state's not going to lose all of it, but there's going to be a lot of power shifted to this new consolidated government, as you guys say. And to me, th th that's all it's about, is that the state's going to lose some power. But her, her rationale, and, and the fact is, the sovereignty of the people, there's not a single state that's going to make the decisions. It's not like Massachusetts is going to lose a voice here. All right? The standing army has to be the composite interest of, of the union itself and of its representatives. That's where I question the sincerity of 
of, of her beliefs that somehow it's going to become tyrannical when in fact for this whole thing to function, you're going to have to have some kind of consolidation, all right, within the, the legislative branches of a national interest to bring out, you know, that standing army. I, I, well, hopefully, tie, Chris, go ahead. The, yeah, tie that, tie that though, and uh, with her, also her complaint about how the chief magistrate, uh, i.e. the president, will be determined. Because when yeah. you tie that with the idea of how the president in this new constitution will be determined, because I think that's one of her complaints. Again, I said this earlier, she doesn't call it the Electoral College, but she does complain about the, the process for determining this because that also will provide for elitism or aristocracy. So now the president you know, is going to be commander in chief of this new national army. You're going to have a limited group of people to determine who that chief magistrate is, as opposed to a much uh, more localized sense of that chief magistrate within the, the state, right? Which will be made up, and that state militia will be made up of, the, of your neighbors. Now you have this national army under the control of a magistrate or a, a president who is going to be Trump chosen by a smaller group of people um, therein, I think there's a link there to that fear. Okay, I, I guess I got to step back to, to re-clarify. Because when I asked this question initially, you guys said that aristocratic meant consolidation. It didn't mean what I and I think many others in a contemporary sense, we see aristocratic as elites in government of the few. You said, no, 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 it's consolidation of of government in an, in a national you know kind of component here uh, are you now saying that it's it's both that there's a fear of cons of a consolidated national government but there's then there's the fear of that government being run by a few people mike you were just well, i mean this is where this is where i think we could all have our own definitions and and she could have her definition i, I to me the word tyranny Tyranny is about the concentration of power. And you can have a concentration of power in the majority, you can have a concentration of power in the few, concentration of power in the one. But when, I mean, the, this notion comes from Aristotle, right? Tyranny is bad. <laughs> so you can have good concentrations of power if the people have a, a say over it. So to me, it's two different things. Arist and, and, and just to, to wrinkle this up a little bit, isn't it John Adams who made the argument that a natural, what he would call a natural aristocracy was a good thing versus an artificial aristocracy? Like there are some of the founders who believe rule the few is fine as long as like we pick the right few. And I think that to Chris's point is what the electoral college in, in its best, the best argument for the electoral college is that you have wise people at the time, wise white men, making sure that the chief magistrate is not just someone that the majority wants and therefore leading to a different type of tyranny. Um, so I think there, I think there are two, two different parts of the aristocracy and the tyranny, and you could play around with which comes and, and what we should be fearing more. Okay. And that's what I was wondering is, is, you know, uh, or is there a you know a dual component to this um and and from what professor kavanaugh was just saying is and again we can look at it the senate the electoral college the supreme court and where it there are these you know undemocratic institutions governed by a few people that clearly could lead to a tyrannical system or concentration of power in the hands of the few there but it's but with along with that is its hands in the power of this consolidated government which will then diminish or destroy the state governments is that kind of the pathway that she's going on here gentlemen yeah and i and i think uh one of the things to think about when you read anti-federalist papers essays is they're willing to take history and run it out if we take this system that you've given us, Philadelphia, let's run that out. Let's uh, let's play. Let's do a mind game. Let's exercise. Let's speculate. So I think that, and that's where uh, some would suggest that's anti-federalists at their worst, because they want to run it out and and uh, create all kinds of boogeymen that could happen. 
Um, and then some say that's the anti-federalists at their best. All I'm saying is anti-federalists have a keen sense of uh, power corrupts. So if that's a basic principle, and, and again, the federalists argue, yeah, we believe that. That's why we have this elaborate system of checks. But the anti-federalists aren't willing to trust the system because they're going to look at that system occupied with people and they're running it out in history and creating these situations leading her to the conclusion that it's an aristocratic tyranny. So Professor Kavanaugh, um, I'd like you to provide some guidance to students because obviously <laughs> they're in trouble. Obviously her, well, obviously her <laughs> argument resonates. All right. Uh, not just at the time in the debates, but I think throughout history, uh, we have seen this ongoing tension, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, between uh, uh, these two points of view, as we have articulated. And I'm wondering if you could identify what you see as some key moments in American history in which people, you know, movements, people, whatever, try to provide some democratic energy, I'll, I'll, I'll phrase it like that, and that may be the wrong way to do that, to these, you know, to these barriers that I, I firmly believe do lay the foundation for aristocratic tyranny. Right. Uh, well, um, I, was, I was thinking what Tim had just said, too, about that was decided by the Civil War. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, good point. Uh, but um, I think, you know, I would probably start with the, and I, I know, Mike, it doesn't really start until 1965, um, <laughs> uh, but I'm going to go with the Bill of Rights. I think that's an important addition, because if it's not there, we don't have a chance to get it incorporated later uh, through the 14th Amendment. I would start with the Civil War Amendments. I want to speak from a constitutional point on my first examples, right? The abolishment of slavery, which it took a civil war. Uh, the 14th Amendment clearly, which is serves as a bridge, I believe, between the ideas of the Declaration of Independence to the Constitution and this idea of equality, uh, which we're still arguing about today. Um, and I think any amendment since then, whether it be the 15th or 19th, the 26th, that expands uh, the franchise, uh, I would definitely think the 17th Amendment for the direct election of senators, uh, taking that away from the state governments where you know, we know that uh, so much corruption was happening during the uh, during the um, the Gilded Age in terms of uh, state legislatures uh, just, you know, taking direct money from people and making them U.S. senators. I think those are some things I would look at uh, right away in terms of a check on the perceived tyranny of the minority and uh, an expansion of the, de the democratic nature. I find it interesting that you you didn't mention the age of Jackson. Ah, yes, that's what I was going to say. I think you know the the spoil system is really an attempt to 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 beat up the elites, get them out of office. These dry, dusty uh, um, old Federalists uh, who are <laughs> who are then, in the no, way. I wouldn't go with the spoil system. Uh, the spoil system would, has been well, there. I, I would go uh, more with yeah, the how about, state. Okay, then how about the bank? Let's do away with an elitist bank and uh, distribute that worked out well. In, in that worked out bank. well. Well, I'm not, I'm not making normative <laughs> statements. The question was, where are these spasms uh, or moments of de democratic increase? Uh, how well, about uh, how about Charles River Bridge case? There's there's a great example of the people's bridge versus the aristocratic elitist bridge. So I, I think I mean David's point's well taken. Maybe maybe for better or worse. We can we can argue about whether Jackson. I would go with Jacksonian democracy in terms of states doing away with property requirements for voting. That yeah. is an expansion of the democratic spirit. Uh, but again, um, it's a limited democracy because we know it really is not going to start until. Uh, there's the presentism. There's the presentism. Well, and I gotta. I <laughs> go ahead, Tim. Because I, I mean, Chris, you 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 have you're ready. You're well, no, to... I think Tim is right. He he's right as as much as it pains me to say it. Um, <laughs> is that? But you know, we we talked about this in the last episode in terms of democracy and aristocracy and all these terms. It's so limited. Women, uh, people of color, Native Americans. You know, we we're still struggling with this today of what these terms mean. So um, you know, it's a very it's a it, it plants seeds. 
and these seeds are continuing to reach fruition uh, with people that have been part of the other and not part of the us. So I'm wondering, Chris, just real quickly, did call this somebody else? Well, no, anybody. Did, well, did this did did the Seventeenth Amendment? And again, I'm asking to look back now from you know uh, the 21st century on back. Did the Seventeenth Amendment actually accomplish its goal as far as a democratic impulse uh, in yes. going after this aristocracy? Yes. Really? Yeah. At the time, yeah, absolutely, because it's part of the. It was actually part of the Populist Party platform yeah. that the Democrats are going to adopt at that time frame. Uh, when it's finally ratified in what 1913 um so it's it's there because of the corruption that was happening at the state level uh case in point uh william clark who owned the largest uh, copper mine in north america the anaconda in montana he literally you know went to the members of the montana state legislature said, i would like to be senator and he was so brazen he handed envelopes with his initials on them to members of the senate and gave them 10 grand each so okay Okay, you make, but being the guy that I am, wouldn't you say that it was a short-term thing? That that fairly quickly the Senate has become uh, again part of uh, uh, Mercy Otis Warren's nightmare. I'm, I'm, I'm saying in, in how we, I'm, I'm saying how we determine senators, right? Not not the Senate itself, because you Point know take. I've made my views known on this program repeatedly how I feel about the Senate. <laughs> Um, and how we determine senators. Mike, uh, go ahead. I mean, but this is where I think that um, her views get complicated, right? I mean, the anti-federalists seem to have this presumption, if you just let people rule themselves at the local and national level, then all good things will come. And to David's point, we, we, we change the system, we have a direct election of the senators, and who are the people electing? A bunch of millionaires a bunch of white male millionaires for the most part, right? And so I don't think, I mean, it's it's an easy argument. Like the, like I said, I'm drawn to the anti-federalism critique. I don't know if, if really, if, if they got everything they wanted, I don't know whether we end up in the same spot, right? Yeah. I mean, if we're going to be a United States, if we're going to be 200 different sovereign Republicans, uh, I'm sorry, re republics, in this territory, then maybe some of those places would be would, be, would live up to the anti-federalist uh, dream. But I just, I guess, my view of human nature and my view of what um, any political elites will do in any system to get power, I don't know if the anti-federalists have a check for that in their scheme of things. Well, and remember our mantra, okay? We've got product people. Hobbs was right, okay? <laughs> exactly so this is what yeah, there it is. There it is, uh, kids. Uh, Fourteen ninety nine. Uh, yeah. You yeah, too. No idea. Something like that. <laughs> on, uh, on sale at national finals. So uh, back uh, back at you, Professor Williams, because uh, now we're we're going to get into the present, and I, you know, and this might drive Professor Moore uh, nuts, but. Yeah, I I would argue that as as I observe America in the 21st century, uh, that it reflects very closely. Now, of course, my initial reading of this question was aristocratic mean, meant government of the few, not necessarily consolidation. I appreciate being clarified, and I and I understand, uh, uh, you know, uh, now you know partly what she meant, but that that we're living her nightmare. Our government is run and controlled by money and interest, as you just said, Professor Williams. Uh, is there somebody who's not a millionaire in the United States Senate? Uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm wondering out loud. I don't know the answer. Uh, we're the most militaristic country in the world, uh, bar none. Uh, uh, you know, and I just read a wonderful essay about, you know, how many years since World War II we've been involved in either overt or covert wars. Uh, and uh, it tops uh, any other nation uh, in the world. And our system does not allow for effective accountability, uh, as we see with the representative from New York. Uh, you know, I don't even know if we know what his name is, uh, for crying out loud. Yet he's going to sit in the House of Representatives and represent his district. So 
Uh, do you agree with me that we're now living uh, uh, Miss Warren's uh, nightmare, that we are an aristocratic tyranny? That we can't, we, I mean, uh, we can go issue by issue. Healthcare, guns, climate change, all the real core issues in this country, we cannot address as a nation. Yes, the laboratories of democracy within the states, uh, you know, wonderful, warm food. But as a nation, we cannot address these issues because of the aristocratic, uh, 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 fun, you know, structure of our government and and uh, 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 the vested interests that do not want change. And I think that's partly and do not want, you know, to provide the people with, uh, you know, dealing with the issues that they want dealt dealt with. Yeah, there's I, my rant. Yeah, no, I, and I think I, I think I would agree with that. I think, I think when I, it's frustrating, right? I, I would, I mean, if, if I was going to give a, a label to our current system of government, it would be plutocracy, right? It's, it's a rule by the, by the money and interest, which I think is what you're kind of putting in with aristocracy there. And what's frustrating about it is that. Um, it's not like the, the uh, aristocrats have somehow set up a system where people can't participate. I, I mean, the avenues are open for folks from the local to the state to the national level to have their voices heard. So it's, it's, it's frustrating because I think there's another element here that just has to do with civic participation, civic engagement, basic basic sort of people being involved. Because I think when people get involved, that the system is set up to respond to their concerns. But I think that most of us just choose not to, either through not voting or not participating. And I can I, see- my, here, Here's my struggle, Mike, is, is the last three elections, have we have seen the highest turnout. I'm pretty much, you know, I'm pretty sure that it's the highest turnout in my life. Yeah. Now, uh, barring, okay, my first 10 years or, or 15 years when I wasn't politically conscious, but as an adult, we have seen the highest turnout rates, all right, in my lifetime. So the people are participating at fairly high rates, but it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter because the institutions designed by the framers are set up in such a way as to guard against, as we talked about in the last session, against democratic impulses. And therefore, the only way to fundamentally change things is the amendment process, all right? And we know, you know how that works out. Uh, and, and I don't know if you guys are aware of this, you know, and Tim I know is, because when he and I first met, I, mean, I, I worshiped at the altar of the Supreme Court. Oh man, I love this court. Isn't it just designed so wonderfully? Did you guys, or are you aware that the Supreme Court has a way to raise money and, and they're spending money to pay a million dollars to a consultant on the Supreme Court? All right. You know, who's really good friends with one of the members of, of the court. If that ain't aristocratic tyranny, I don't know what is. Sorry, I now it's my second rant. I don't know what's uh, going on. Today. I think so, uh, this is a decidedly national view. I mean, I really do think at local level, like um, like in my community, uh, there was uh, a lot of grassroots bottom up rattle and hum about um, water. We have a um, not a lack of water, but a lack of good water here in our county. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's so I think. You, I'll grant you that uh, uh, at the national level, we've got some real, real problems. And uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Warren, you, you diagnosed that early. But I'm, again, I'm, I think you kind of minimized the, the, the grassroots bottom up. No, okay, uh, so can, can, I, can I channel Madison? All right, then that'd be James, not Madison, Wisconsin, but James Madison here. Okay. Uh, here's my problem, Tim, is... Uh, you talk about localism, but you're, I think you're very aware in Wisconsin and, and in states around the country, state governments are usurping local government yes. decisions. Yes. And in, right. in the state of Wisconsin, there are some communities raising holy hell uh, about Milwaukee. the state legislature holding, uh, holding local communities hostage by not uh, revenue sharing 
so I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of stuff going on at a local level that I think you, uh, that you have to factor into your critique. Chris, you've been kind of quiet on this one. Well, no, I'm just listening. I, I do think that, um, I'm not sure if it's an aristocracy as a much as a control thing. And I want to go way back for a second. I don't think consolidation and, and aristocracy are mutually exclusive. Right. I think, yeah, yeah I think there, there is, there's, I mean, her complaint about aristocracy is, uh, I don't want to say synonymous, but there is linked to the idea of consolidation. Um, and I think, you know, we see, uh so many cultural issues today driven by a, a mass media uh that you know I, I see it happening in i see it happening in our state in our state legislature with uh proposed legislation uh in our state legislature um it kind of david to your very point about um you know we're going to allow you local control as long as your local control Cohen, it goes along with what we want here within our state legislature because we have the power to to control that um i don't know i think some of her complaints and some of the uh anti-federalist complaints have come to fruition i think we see that today and and, and tim uh, tim's point earlier about they like to, to to run that out i think that you know they were kind of prescient in in that regard and we start to see that and again I don't know, though, that it's, uh, I think it's operator error. I think it's human nature. And we, we discussed this in the last episode about moving so far away from uh, the idea of uh, my responsibilities as a citizen, because I'm so worried about my rights as a citizen. And I think we've, we've lost track of that, which allows us to get into these ruts about control. And that control has to match up with the majority at the state legislature. Can I ask you something, Chris? Do elections matter? Um, yes. So if 72 percent, all right, by every poll that I've seen in the last two months, they want something done about gun violence. And it is one of many factors that led to the Democratic upset. They didn't win the House, but they obviously disrupted what was predicted. And part of that had to do with gun violence. Yet we're going to see nothing coming out of our national government on gun violence, which tells me that elections don't matter. Well, well you, can't, you can't cherry pick though, Dave. I'm sorry, Chris, go ahead. No, no, I, I think that elections do matter because you get to see uh, who gets to be on the court at some times, right? Uh, who has control of the court. And we saw that certainly uh, in the last administration. So I do think elections matter. Um, and it's interesting, David, because I, I was trying to find a link and I, I forgot to save it for myself, but I'm going to find it and add it to resources. Um, years ago, um, we, we looked at a paper by two professors, two political science professors, Michael uh, Page and Gill, and one from Northwestern and one from Princeton, maybe. And they talked about, and they don't use the word oligarchy, but they talk about the, the United States is no longer a democratic republic. We've moved into the realm of oligarchy. And I think, David, that's what you're describing. But a lot of people and political scientists will push back on their premise about that, and they will look at numbers. And I'm going to share this. I'll find this article and I'll share it in resources. And it's really good, I think, for students of this question, and perhaps maybe you don't want to dive into too, because it's actually what we want as a say we're generally middle of the road kind of folks. What we want does tend to make it into legislation at times. I was in the feeling that it, you know. The majority, like you said, David, the majority of Americans say want to do something about gun violence, and that doesn't happen. Um, and I would say that speaks to the anti-democratic nature of the Constitution as it works today. Again, but again, it's I think it's I think it's operator error. It's not the words on the paper. Tim, you want to jump in here? Yeah, I I, I guess I would say honestly if you were looking at the last 40 years you'd be hard pressed to say the elections don't matter i think the Re the reagan revolution for better or worse the reagan revolution has proved that elections matter and, and think about if you told me as a as a kid in, in uh, uh 1973 january 22nd that uh 
it, that row would be where it is right now. Uh, I mean, that's an amazing story about how elections matter over a huge period of time. Um, and, you know, so I, I think elections do matter. And uh, I mean, this is actually uh, Kramer's point in his book about the court, that elections do matter. And over a period of time, the court shifts because the court has taken, you know, it's, it's, it's saying which way the wind blows. So I think elections do matter. Um, and my first piece of evidence is the Reagan revolution unfolding the last 40 years, I think, does demonstrate that elections matter. And that's that's why we don't have gun. That's why we don't have gun legislation, because elections uh, matter. Now, the better question is, are they good elections? And now we're into I mean, there there's there's where we move over to Mike uh, in his <laughs> assessment of what, whether elections matter or not. I think good elections versus bad elections. That That's a good that's a that's a biggie. Mike, what, what do you mean, mean good it's, versus it's, bad? I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Good question. Well, whether um, I mean, we got the gerrymandering, we got the, the moneyed interest, we got all of that that I think pollutes the question of whether it's a good election or not. If I could channel my inner, inner liberal there for for a minute. Um, yeah, I know. It's a little creepy. Wait, I'm gonna have to, I, I'm I've never listen. seen that in our liberal. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's the funny Wait, thing. Are, are you taking that? pain medication for your back? Yeah, okay. Yeah, oxy. Oxy. <laughs> Kids were, yeah, sorry about that. When he, so, I mean, really does that not. help when you mean like good, good election? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. No, that's what I was wondering. Uh, Professor yeah. Williams? On good elections and bad elections? Anything. Anything. Because <laughs> I, 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 I went on a couple of rants and, uh, 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 you know, here, but just to, general thoughts about uh, where we're at in the 21st century and, you know, her notion of uh, aristocratic tyranny. And uh, I know yeah. you, you provided the initial uh, response, but... Uh, yeah, Look, uh, elections matter, whatever we've talked about here. I, I could make the counter argument that, that, I mean, I can make the counter argument that we have small d democratized too much, and that's the problem. Like, if you, the issue of accountability in politics, I could trace back to the primaries, right? Um, and the fact that in primary elections, we have what, 20% of the populace comes out the vote, and you get these people in the candidates who, represent the extreme of both parties, and that's a problem. Media has democratized, and how, how's that treating you lately, right? So I think, I, again, I think that, that, for me, my understanding of the anti-federal argument in a nutshell, Tim, don't hurt me, is that, you know, question institutions, institutions are bad, let the people have their say, or at least let the institutions at the local level govern us. and. I see a deinstitutionalization in this country the last 40 years and a and a movement to small de-democratize. And I think a lot of a lot of the issues we've been talking about right now come from that as well. So it's not a it's not a one-way street on this. I think it's going in both directions. All right. So time again, as always, uh, is uh, an enemy of the uh, Constitution of American life. So uh, as we do, I'd like each of our FOPs uh, to provide uh, some uh, insights and recommendations to uh, students and teachers uh, as they prepare for the next uh, uh, event. So, uh, Professor Williams, we'll start with you. Um, goodness gracious. Um, <laughs> I know, I should probably have a, a fixed order on this thing. No, no, it's fine. But, I, I um, like catching you with deer in the headlights. Yeah, no, I, well, I think, I mean, two things that jumped out at me from our discussion. One is that um, <clears throat> some of the frustrations that you as students or that we as a country feel about the democracy um, aren't new, right? I, they've, there's been part of our conversation since the beginning. And I think that, that looking at this text helps with that. And the second thing is like what I raised at the beginning, just about definition of terms. I mean, I don't, I don't know if we've modeled that well as a group, <laughs> like how to come to a consensus on these terms, but I think we have modeled what it looks like when we're all talking about different labels and definitions and how you have to like, you have to acknowledge that. You have to say, okay, for this argument, this is what I mean by this term. So then we can have a conversation. Otherwise, it's very easy to have conversations where you're you're defining terms differently, and it's always difficult to have that have that happen. Yeah. Excellent, Professor Moore. Yeah, I my recommendation. I mean, to me, it's remarkable the power of a word. 
and the power of that word aristocratic in in the 1780s is remarkable in the sense that it's a word that is a um it's red meat because of the revolution uh it's the power of the american revolution that i think enlivens that word aristocratic in the federalist anti-federalist debates the anti-federalists know that they know the power of the revolution they constantly wave the bloody shirt of the revolution um the power and the ethos and the trajectory so it's the power of a word that strikes me as most notable about this uh this quotation she does a remarkable thing by tapping into that word aristocratic chris um i'm going to kind of dovetail with michael too and i said this at the beginning don't try to make that straight line between the the vocabulary of 1787 1776 and 1787 1788 and to where we are today because as mike said we did not model that very well when we jumped around so think about how you're defining aristocracy in 1787 versus what we think of a modern aristocracy today and understand that and david your question to me is i think it's an excellent question for kids to consider what are these what are these fifth sense starts have been along the way of our during our experiment because there have been times where we have consolidated power and there's been ways that we've expanded uh, small d democracy and there have been times when it's been it's been curtailed so think about those historical examples as you move forward and I, and I said this at the end of our last episode um sit down and talk with your folks and you know one uh, you, for you folks that are working on this Mercy Otis Warren question, sit down with your folks and you know one that are working on the Socrates question, because I think you're going to see a lot of common research uh, that will help you and make both arguments stronger. So um, I guess uh, my thoughts, uh, students and teachers, are that, I, I, you know, Professor Williams has said this in the past a, a few times sometimes we are too fixated on the federalists and the federalist papers and we treat them like uh there's you know uh the holy grail uh the ten commandments coming down from the mountaintop and uh it is the end all and be all of what the constitution is uh which hopefully you've learned from us you can't treat them that way uh given the context but i i do also believe that the anti-federalists especially in modern political discussion, the anti-federalists get shortchanged and that uh, we need to maybe uh, consider their views because uh, through my discussions with these uh, three great minds is I I've come uh, over the last year or so to really see that maybe in the last analysis, the anti-federalists had a lot going for them as far as their arguments. And so, uh, this question allows you, I think, the latitude to really promote the anti-federalist critique of the Constitution, especially as time goes by. Um, uh, over time, as we see it, as uh, Professor Moore said, let's see it how it plays out, that so much of what the anti-federalists have to point out uh, maybe becomes the truth. So uh, think about that. As at this moment, we don't know what our next uh, subject's going to be, but I guarantee you, uh, we'll be uh, full of vim and vigor and uh, enthusiasm uh, to talk to you about the Constitution and American life. Until that happens, peace, love, yogurt, tacos, bye-bye, bye-bye.